or is certainly um, uh, experiencing those changes is our community. And I think we're finding it very, very appealing to those who have uh, joined St. Simons or are part of St. Simons. Along these lines, um, the community at large uh, is undergoing uh, changes. Um, again, I don't think there's gonna be any big surprises uh, with this, but there might be a few. Uh, and there's certainly things that maybe moving forward, we need to be a little bit more cognizant of. And that uh, when we start exploring um, the what of what we're about uh, to embark on, I think it'll it'll kind of make more and more sense. Um, the first thing, and I, I think this was just interesting, we talked about this at our vestry retreat, is that according to the Episcopal National Church, even though our uh, building is and our congregation is located in Arlington Heights. Uh, the parish boundaries uh, in terms of our community extend beyond this. And this was the graphic that I pulled directly from uh, the Episcopal uh, Church. Um, so you see that our, our Arlington Heights is the location of the parish, but not the parish community that extends out. And along those lines, um, there are some uh, distinctions that I think are important to, to note. So using our 2017 CAT survey as our most recent a touch point uh, with the congregation, uh, it reveals that the demographics of St. Simon simply does not mirror the community we serve. When it comes to a comparison by age, uh, you can get a sense that we are an older community, okay, or older congregation, I should say. There is a little asterisk by this because although I tried very, very hard, um, this is actually a comparison of the St. Simon's congregation against Arlington Heights. So it is not that broader community. The next two slides are, but I, I, I failed in my attempt to get that age uh, direct com comparison. Although I think it's probably fair to say that Arlington Heights is either fairly representative or maybe there's actually more of a younger component uh, to the broader community. However, these comparisons are uh, true of that broader um, uh, geographic uh, uh, community boundaries here. And you can see that there is much less diversity uh, in the St. Simon's congregation than there is in our broader community. And when it comes to overall average income, uh, you can see again that uh, St. Simon's community is not uh, representative of that broader uh, community itself, or congregation is not. So we, you know, uh, and again, I don't think this is a big surprise. We are uh, a little bit older, uh, we are uh, wealthier, and uh, we are less diverse than the, uh, the community that we uh, serve. Furthermore, our society has been changing. So not just our little parish community, but our, the movements in our society. Some are specific impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then others are a product of uh, specific uh, social justice movements of this past year. And that I'd probably put a little uh, caveat of the past set of years as more and more issues seem to become part of our national conversation. As part of our vestry um, retreat, uh, Jenny had uh, the vestry members read um, a book entitled uh, We Shall Be Changed. And it was a, a set of essays by a variety of uh, Episcopal church leaders um, specifically, and taking a look at how the pandemic um, and other issues of 2020 have impacted um, uh, congregations. And one of the things that caught our attention was uh, one of the authors suggested that when you combine the COVID-19 pandemic and the systemic racism that was heightened in this past year, uh, or awareness of uh, was heightened, it was as if the church was on fire. And we started having more opportunities to reflect about what we are as church, what we are as uh, congregations, uh, and what we are as uh, disciples. And some of the questions that it raised for us, and I think that that's really what it did. It was a set of like, here are some challenges, here are some questions, here are some ways parishes are, are uh, handling and confronting some of the changes. But I think the thing that stood out in terms of my uh, segment here is um, we started to see and maybe experience some revelations about our society um, that were a little uncomfortable 
I think, uh, to, to handle. Uh, we started to question whether we're showing a refusal to accept basic minimum responsibility for the well-being of others, and maybe that's extended to the sense of obligation that we've had to each other. Uh, some of you uh, might recall in the fall, um, uh, Adult Formation put together a social justice, well, economic justice a series, and um, the way we titled it was uh, What We Owe Each Other. And we started to see this kind of being questioned um, in, in this book, um, even with as, as, again, in my opinion, I will just kind of insert this, when it came to the notion of uh, wearing a mask during the pandemic, um, there might be reasons that you personally might feel that that is not something you wanted to do or you felt infringed upon a particular choice. Um, but when you frame that or paired it with the idea, but do it to protect other people, that protect other people didn't, wasn't necessarily always part of the conversation. It was more about this internal, how might I be impacted, not how my actions might impact others. So it was interesting to see that. And again, the challenge that started uh, to come from this is moving um, the, the ministry um, outside of the, of, the, of the church building and into the world community. As a parish, um, there have been uh, many opportunities to reimagine what church is. And I think, again, you, you see some of the things that has happened here at St. Simon's that has truly been remarkable, I think, to, to continue uh, with our virtual worlds. But again, these questions about are we effectively communicating the faith? Um, uh, is this physical separation creating opportunities for us to extend out and, and beyond? Um, and the virtual worship has been incredibly popular. So as we transition back to uh, what will in a, inevitably be a new normal, uh, what are those elements that we don't want to lose? And how can that vis uh, virtual presence actually be important to the future uh, of the church? And again, I didn't uh, mean to uh, uh, skip this. Um, um completely but it did suggest in, in that book that there there might be some things that need to get kind of uh, pruned and we we had to shake off and we find out um what needs to stay and and how we can become stronger and stronger as a parish as a society um uh, the opportunities to reimagine uh, our ministry and in our outreach um the pandemic sh certainly shed light on the inequities um as disproportional impacts on marginalized groups became more visible. And I think we all saw this with issues of job loss and poverty, uh, education, even vaccine accessibility. Uh, again, not that these were new issues, but we certainly had much more attention on them as, as the pandemic had a very disproportionate impact on certain groups of people. Um, the death of George Floyd uh, certainly, again, brought to the forefront issues of white supremacy and systemic racism, um, which, again, put even more and more attention on general inequity uh, that can be tied to race and discrimination. And then additional issues have been uh, raised in the past year uh, uh, in terms of hate crime, gun violence. All of these, again, nothing is new about any of these issues or these concerns or these problems, but the last year um, has taken the focus and, and put it more and more and more on, on these issues, which force congrega congregations to evaluate how well we currently address the issues, uh, these types of issues, and to discern some new ways that we could become more effective. The ultimate conclusion, um, again, from the, the taking from that uh, We Shall Be Changed book, uh, bells are ringing that cannot be unrung. And I think that that is a, a way of thinking about all of this moving forward. Um, the events uh, of recent years, the, this epidemic uh, of the recent years, truly accelerate um, uh, our realities. We get, we, we can see things in ways that maybe we've never seen them before because we've seen the impacts a little bit more directly. Um, and we start thinking about what do we need moving forward? What do we have? And then what uh, might be best uh, moving forward? We've certainly learned uh, that uh, more about ourselves as a community uh, and, and as a church that we are more uh, about people than place. 
Um, we can begin to question more and more, is it time for the parish to evolve into something new to better meet the challenges uh, and, and provide um, uh, places of more opportunity? And again, tying back with where uh, Louise uh, had us, uh, being a Magi uh, parish, uh, we don't have a sense that St. Simon's is uh, a parish that wants to go back to the way it was, but we want to be ready for uh, the church that is to come. And that that can be incredibly, um, a very much of a challenge, but also can be very exciting and inspiring moving forward. So with that, as we start thinking about our journey forward um, and uh, tie it back to uh, where Jenny started us and will take us and finish us. Um, the values, as Louise kind of pointed out, sort of shape why we do what we do. Um, some of the shifts in our church and our society determine maybe what we need to do. And then uh, the plan that we are moving towards uh, will better express how we will proceed uh, to uh, to meet uh, those challenges uh, of our of our time. So with that, I'm I I guess I will open it up to any comments or questions as well, uh, and then Jenny can take us home. Again, just um, just to dovetail on what Mike has said. Um, in our work in the vestry, we talked a lot about why, what, and how. And um, if, you, if you are curious, go to YouTube and look at a, a, a video by a guy named Simon Sinek. And it's like the golden circle or something. But why we do anything governs what we do and how we do it. And oftentimes organizations start with the, well, what should we do? How should we do it? Why are we doing it? Um, and so that's why we're spending a lot of time. Um, why do we do any of this? Why are we sitting here this morning? Why do we, why do we you know, like have budgets? Why do we have uh, classes for our kids? Why, why? What, 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 what are we doing here? Um, and so it's those values that we, we really want everything to tie back to because our why governs everything. And that why rarely changes. And, and, and Louise gave a really great um, testimony of that at St. Simon's. The values at St. Simon's have remained pretty consistent. So in particular, uh, as Mike so um, uh, effectively explained, when things change around us, the what we do and the how we do it can vary widely, but the why really doesn't. Um, and, and so we, we want to make sure that we're anchored in that why. Um, so as Mike said, we can be ready. We can, what, what is, what is, um, you know, uh, what is this 2021? What does 2051 St. Simons have to say to us? today and how can we listen to that so questions or 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 concerns and noting both what Charlotte said and then thank you Carol for your comment in the chat as well as Mike, um, the, the what and the how need to include care for the smallest of our siblings uh, and forming them and the eldest of our siblings and caring for them too and everyone in between. But, but those things will begin to show up as we get more specific about our call as a congregation and our goals that we want to set for ourselves. Carol has a question, Jenny. Hi, hi, Carol. Okay. Do you do you want to field the questions or let's all three? We'll all pitch in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I also saw Charlotte, I saw your hand too. So Carol, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to to say that that I think that the 
that the children and families goes to a why, not even a, a what or a how. I think we need to incorporate that into our core values um, and not just in the what's in the hows, but it needs to be a core value in what we're doing, in, in what we do that, um, because otherwise 20 years, the, the, the 2051 church will not exist if we haven't done that work now. And that is a concern that certainly I heard and was expressed previously. Um, the work that we did to get to these four sort of core values was the result of a lot of people. And, and th that voice was included. But again, that's going to show up um, further down the road. And it has been heard. And it has been that song has been received and, and sung. Um, and, and yes, it's going to be there. It, it needs to be there. So thank you, Carol. Okay, so I saw Charlotte, and now I see S Sandra as well. Uh, so Charlotte, what, what were you thinking, or what did you like? Well, yes. sort of dovetailing a little bit with Carol, because um, I do think that we really, really need to be intentional um, about how we're going to get the reinvestment of young people into the church. I mean, uh, young people with children. I mean, it's not the children who can come on their own. So we have to capture, we have to capture the adults. And, you know, I have my adult son and his wife, she wasn't raised in any religion. He was dragged to church by me, rather rejected it. Um, he's not an atheist, but church is not a part of their lives. And um, it, it should be, if they could get a lot out of it, if somehow they could get, you know, um, involved. And so yeah. I, I see how that is. And I'm really concerned about that. And I don't think that we do enough somehow to do it. And we have some really talented, creative people who reach out. I mean, like we've got Joe and Adiz and Cleo and, you know, who all come up with wonderful ideas, but somehow we're not getting there. I don't know. You know, we just aren't getting there. Mm -hmm. And I've taught Sunday school for 37 years now. And it was sad how few kids we had, even pre-pandemic, coming to church school. I mean, you prepare a lesson, you spend a long time, and you're teaching to two kids. You know, that's crazy. And it's three grades. So we really need to think about that. And I'll be interested to see what steps we're going to take, whether you're going to form committees or what you're going to do. But I volunteer to be on that one, okay? <laughs> and and I, I, care. I would encourage... Um, as we think through that issue around children and families, um, that we think, well, why? Why do we want children and families here? And, and, and if the answer is, uh, because we want them to know God, that value is represented in our core values. Mm -hmm. If the answer is, well, because if we don't, then the church will die. Then one of our core values needs to be you know, maintenance uh, or mm -hmm. something like that. But that's not what we heard from, from you. I, again, I, I can't underscore enough um, that that concern is heard and valued. Um, and, and, and it is something that we will be addressing. So thank you for voicing that. Sandra, okay. I, think, I think Michael raised your hand as well. So am I next? You are. Okay, so um, something I heard on a podcast um, from Bishop Curry uh, was the Jesus, Jesus movement and um, alternative orthodoxy is great, but I would, when we think about why, the Jesus movement is to be more like Jesus and um, and Jesus and his relationship with his father and, and extending um, like we do at St. Simon's to the margins. Um, I don't know what it looks like, but I like the term of Jesus movement and maybe we can kind of consider that a little bit. The other thing, uh, I didn't notice anything about the, the digital divide, mm. which really does separate us well it certainly did with the with the pandemic i mean 
at least we're coming together a little bit. But, but even Jenny, you said, well, if you go on YouTube, you can find this. It's just becoming so natural that we, you know, we refer to um, Richard Rohr's daily meditations and uh, all these, you know, all these things that people who are not, either don't have computers or don't know how to use them. So that's just another issue. Hmm. I have no how to do any of this. Uh, but it does become an issue of, of justice and equity. Yes, it does. Um, yeah. And we often think of food and clothing and education and healthcare and voting and yes, all of those, yes. And uh, yeah. access. So thank you. Yeah, Sandra. And thank you for saying that maybe Jesus movement is a little more um, less wonky than alternative orthodoxy, maybe a little bit right. more clear. Uh, I think so. Yeah. All right. Appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. Michael, I saw your hand and we've just got about five more minutes, six more minutes. Um, just as a reminder to all of us, Michael, go. Yeah. Um, I think I just wanted to echo what you had said following um, Charlotte's comments about really understanding why it is that um, we think it's important to be reaching an audience of uh, young families because uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think that the reason should be maintenance of the church to, you know, prepare it to be passed on to a new generation. I, like I, that's, I think the kind of the wrong why. And so um, I think understanding that, um, understanding that why is the core value. And then, um, you know, if, if the core value is to, you know, have, you know, have God be present in, in everyone's life, then that, of course, includes young families. Um, and if we see that as a deficiency in kind of our programming and what, what we are bringing, then that's, that's, how and, that's how and what we are focusing on. Okay. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Mike, Louise, anything that you would like to? I'm, I'm seeing Sandy. Uh, Sandy's hand up. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say okay. yeah. um, the reason I think we have so much problem with the young people coming to church is that everything else that goes on Sunday. When my children were growing up, there were no sports on Sundays. Um, everything was Saturday or after school. Now, it's on Sunday, it's just a, a natural thing. And I think that, you know, uh, sports are becoming more important mm. than going to church, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Well, and I think it's, it, I think it, it's there that, that's okay. I think it's there that we need to really concentrate because mm -hmm. if they don't start young, then uh, you can't expect them to start later in their 20s. They're just not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for, for lifting that up. Sometimes I think about um, what is it about the soccer field that is so compelling that I'm going to get up at 730 in the morning on a wet, cold, sleeting spring morning and stand in the middle of the field with my kid. <laughs> <laughs> In there, done that though. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what is it? There's a value there, right? That governs the behavior. The why is what's governing the what and the how. And so, as we explore those things about ourselves, um, I, I think that might be something that we say, hmm, what, what's going on there that we could learn from? But, but you're right, Sandy, there's a lot going on. And as um, our society, uh, is um, we don't have Sundays off anymore. Uh, Sundays aren't set aside anymore like they were societally. Well, um, Jenny, I see Lynn. Lynn has his hand up. Hey, Lynn, well, you can you can be our last comment here. Go for it. <laughs> well, I, I think the two themes that we've heard, one from Charlotte and one from Sandy, are both uh, quite important. Um, I think Sandy is right that we do have the rise of alternative things that parents are valuing higher than going to church with their children. But I don't think we should overlook what Charlotte's experience was and my own. I took my kids to church um, every Sunday 
through many decades while they were growing up. They're now in their 40s. I have one daughter who's not married. She wouldn't darken the door of a church other than for, uh, you know, just special occasions. And my second daughter who's married and has two kids, they have never taken them to church. Mm -hmm. So there's something else going on just between, other than just uh, there are alternative things to church. And it's been going on for quite a long time. I think it's going to, it's maybe something the vestry needs to spend some time on, but really it's, it's society wide and it's going to be very hard to, to uh, turn that trend around, even for our own parish. So I don't think it's just alternative things. There's something else going on. Well, and I think, Lynn, thank you for, for saying that. Um, so so I, what I think I hear you saying, and in my experience as a mother, um, just because you march your kids to church every Sunday, and just because they go to Sunday school every Sunday, does not uh, a mature and uh, committed adult Christian make. Um, so, so maybe the, the solution isn't to get people here, but to, to examine how we are um, taking the message of God's love and care for people out. I don't know. And we don't know <laughs> is the reality. And, and we being led and guided by the Holy Spirit are going to do some really interesting, scary, maybe sometimes, um, thrilling, God-led work together over this next year. And I don't know where we're going to land, but I do know that we don't do this alone. We do it with one another, and we do it empowered by the Spirit, who is already doing this stuff. We're just trying to figure out what it is so we can get in on the, on the game. Um, we, we're not creating the church here. Uh, the force of God's Spirit is active in the world, and we are discerning where we are called to join that force. And I am so grateful to be here with you. Um, you know, uh, if, if any congregation can do this, it's St. Simon's, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, it's so clearly obvious. Um, so thank you for your prayers. Please pray for uh, your vestry and your rector. Um, please let any of us know any, you know, sometimes when you hear something, you need a little time to let it, let it percolate. And, and if you have thoughts about what you've heard this morning, shoot one of us an email or, or a phone call and, and let us know because your voice is part of this.